told you that MILF Manor Season 2 was actually a surprisingly deep and complex show. I'd be lying to you is what I was doing, let's be real here. It's a fairly vapid reality television show that features thirst trap shots of 50 year old women lusting after 20 something himbos who want to be on TV for all the wrong reasons. But what if I said that Milk Manor was actually surprisingly complex for what it is and more meaningful than it has any right to be? Then I'd be telling the truth. What's up everybody, my name is Patrick, but my friends call me Pat, and today I want to talk about MILF Manor Season 2, which sounds a lot more like an SNL sketch than a real thing that really exists. Coming up on the season finale of MILF Island, holy hot mamas, but who will be the final mommy you'd like to Oh, you know. It's so fascinating to me because it's both one of the most innovative reality TV shows we've seen in like 20 years, and it's also a show that features gratuitous shots of 60-year-old women shaking their boobies while mud wrestling. Uh, it's crazy, and I just said those words out loud. It is a show of contradiction, stupidity, and beauty. And when I say beauty, I'm not just talking about the MILFs. Although speaking as a gay man, I am proud to report that the show did in fact turn me straight. Either this chick is a dude, or Halpert got scared straight. So today we're taking a look at the philosophy of Milf Manor Season 2 in the first six episodes. Because I watched five episodes of Milf Manor Season 2 for this video, and I am not watching another seven unless people like and comment on this video. And I'm not in my normal spot for this video because Delta delayed my flight home by three days. So, you know, you can also leave a like on this video if you feel bad for me. I'll take, I'll take anything I can get. Every show on television is saying something about society, big or small, and is saying something about the context of which it was created in. That one's for you, Mamala. We need you to be Mamala of the country. And this is also true for reality television, which is why I appreciate the genre, because it's really like one of the most underestimated genres that exists. No one really takes it seriously. Just like me, whenever I tell any of my parents, friends, or any adult over the age of 40 that I have a YouTube channel. But you can interpret reality television the same way you can interpret music, movies, and literature. So today we're gonna look at MILF Manor season two the way one might look at Shakespeare. And that is probably the first and last time that MILF Manor season two has ever been compared to Shakespeare. Although, you know, in my opinion, Shakespeare would have been all over those MILFs. So okay, MILF Manor season two, I'm going to take you seriously. I'm going to be probably the first person and last person in all of history to do that. And in the process of doing that, I've learned things that are both hilarious, funny, and, you know, surprisingly complex because Milk Manor Season 2 does have a handful of heartwarming moments. They're buried deep down, but they are there. So if you're not familiar with the premise of Milk Manor Season 2 because you haven't watched it, you haven't spent five hours watching the show and then written a 3,000 word video for YouTube about it, <laughs> this is the premise. A bunch of mothers who are from the age of 45 to 59 and who are physically attractive, obviously hence the name Mothers I'd Like to Fuck, uh, are in a house and they're trying to find love with a bunch of younger men who are all in their early to mid 20s. It's a simple premise and is similar to season one, although I will note just because I find it really funny, season one took place in a beautiful villa in Mexico and now we are just in a house in rural Canada. So yes, we can finally confirm it. In Canada, you are more likely to live in a house full of a bunch of horned up older women than you are to actually be able to afford to buy a home yourself. Sorry. Come on, it's Canada. You guys are like apologizing, right? <laughs> the environment being a lot less glamorous, I feel like it makes the entire scenario a lot funnier and a little bit weirder because at least if you're in a beautiful Mexican villa you can kind of justify the things that happen in the course of the season as being like well at least I'm in Mexico and it's warm and nice out. Like if you're trying to have sex with somebody who has your son's exact name and looks a lot like your son it's a lot better to be doing it in a Mexican villa than in a, a rural Canadian house would just be my perspective. And it is so weird because my son's name is Joey and they kind of look alike. For all the meaning and deep moments we're going to take from the show, it is, at its core, uh, exceptionally trashy. And I love it for that, to be honest with you. So understandably, this show does have a lot to say about age and love and finding love at any age, not unlike The Golden Bachelor, which recently aired, showing that sex is not just for young people, despite what society might want you to believe. And I'll just say it, 
I know I'm young, but I'm buying stock on this early, right? I was thirsting over 69-year-old Jerry getting into a immediate flawed reality TV marriage. Anyone at any age should be able to go on a reality television show, tell multiple women that you love them, get married on live television, end up divorced two months later, and really, I think that's kind of beautiful. So sue me if I want to keep that option open for myself in 50 years. But back to the more interesting show, back to Milk Manor Season 2. Let's see how, in the very first minutes of the show, they're bringing us into their world. We meet Jamie, who is, spoiler alert, going to eventually be voted off the island, Survivor style. Heidi! We no longer want to hit that. Get off Milk Island. But, for now, is giving us an introduction to some of the show's central themes and what they actually believe. Dating at my age sometimes is very intimidating. I actually struggle with it at times because it's hard to be taken seriously. Jamie talks a lot about the hypocrisy of society. Valid points. Having two divorces with three children, there is trauma there. And I find the way that divorce is talked about, this isn't going to be the first time, obviously a show about love has to talk about divorce as well. I find it to be rather interesting, especially in a reality TV show, a genre that is historically and arguably still, even in this show, exploitative towards women. I have so much Botox, I can't even smile. But I find honestly all of this to be a rather measured approach to things that are stigmatized in society aging, dating, being in divorces. You're viewed as often if you're trying to do these things, especially date later in life, you are stigmatized by society. And the show is right to point out that this is wrong. And there are inherent difficulties and trauma that we do carry from our past relationships. We don't stop being developed people once we go over the age of 45. Now, yes, the woman who is saying all these things and making all these valid points in about 20 minutes is going to be rubbing maple syrup on shirtless younger men. There's no but if you're waiting for a but. I mean, there's no but in the sentence. In the challenge, there are a lot of buts. The show will continue to weigh in on heavy topics while also objectifying their contestants every single episode at the midpoint, usually with a challenge that is uh, quite sexual in nature, generally. But yeah, the show talks at length about the social stigma that exists for older women dating younger men. I am open to dating younger guys, but I feel like the women get a bad reputation. It's almost like we're doing something bad. And you know what? That. And they also are not afraid to make jokes about it, or the producers are not afraid to make jokes about it. I don't smell like an old person, and I definitely don't want my man to smell like an old person either. I'll just point out here, just very quickly, if you're not familiar with reality TV shows at all, because honestly, a lot of people don't really know what goes into it. A lot of lines that you see in these confessionals are not coming from the people themselves. They're being told explicitly what to say by producers. So just important to be skeptical, especially if you see a confessional like that, which is really like, oh, that doesn't really feel like something a normal person would say. That feels like something a 30-something reality television producer would write. Anyways, the show also talks about the fact that for these older women, being in these relationships with younger men can actually be beneficial for both parties. And they're making some pretty valid points. And frankly, we do live in a society which has a double standard about what older women can do versus what older men can do. And you know, it is a little weird living in a society where Leonardo DiCaprio can just discard women Andy from Toy Story style the second they reach the age of 25, but we can't exactly appreciate the inverse. I'm of course talking about the original lover of MILFs, President of France, Emmanuel Macron. I'm also trying to be as objective as I can here, but you'll have to forgive me if I'm struggling because I find it hard to put myself in the orthopedic shoes of a 52-year-old who wants to date a 21-year-old. Okay, so sorry, sorry, sorry. That's the last joke about age I will make personally. The show is content to just do it for me. There's also just a lot of comedy in the situations that come up in the show, like come, sit here and tell me with a straight face that it isn't hilarious to see a date between a 23-year-old and a 45-year-old. What do you think you'll sum with him? Ooh. <laughs> mm. I think it'd probably be like, why are you not dating somebody your age kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? Are you getting a boner? Mm. Yeah. But for as much as this show has to say about age and about the hypocrisy and double standards with younger men and older women, it does kind of become a little bit confusing because literally in episode two, the dads arrive. 
the show has a lot less to say about age gap relationships when the average age of the men in the house goes from 24 to 42. It does talk kind of about the contrast between, oh, I can choose to date an older man or a younger man, and that's displayed here with this clip. Oh my god, the dads are hotter than the sons. This is basically a less interesting version of the twist from season one, where the dating pool was exclusively made up of mother-son duos. Because the dads and the sons have enough sort of shared decency to not really compete with each other for the same woman, and it becomes readily apparent which of the women wants to date a younger guy, and which of them are more interested in a man who literally sells private jets. I work in aviation sales. I sell jets. I have three children. You know, the dads are obviously a lot more advanced in their careers. The show says this, and it's really hard to blame a woman for wanting to date someone who owns multiple restaurants instead of an event promoter, which is a very fake job for a 21-year-old to have. Almost as fake a job as being a consultant. Shots fired! And fired is what you will be if you see your company hiring a lot of those consultants or laid off. The polite term. You worked um, for a company that was fixing bread prices. Uh, no. I work for a consulting company. I'll also note here that for as much as the show wants to talk about the hypocrisy of how society looks at older men and older women, the ages of the dads is a lot less readily apparent because they're introduced usually with their sons, but even when they aren't, the ages aren't displayed. Like, one of the men we literally don't find out how old he is until two episodes later. And I just find that interesting because that was a very intentional choice because we see the age of literally every single woman the second she is introduced, but for men, it's not as important. Almost like the show is basically parroting what society believes. And I want to point out something very obvious. These are not ordinary men in their 50s. Give me a fucking break. Don't believe me? Well, in the episode they're introduced, the dads compete against their sons in a stripping competition where we learn that every single one of these dads has a six pack. It's mind boggling. And really, in that entire episode, the main characterization of these people before we get to learn that they are, yes, in fact, people with hopes, dreams, all that boring stuff, uh, is that the women think they're very hot. As much as I do like Jacob and we're vibing, I mean, the dads are so hot. And to be honest, yeah, the women aren't wrong. That was what I noticed when they were introduced. And also I noticed that one of the men was on crutches, which is very rare. You very rarely see that in reality TV shows. I thought that was neat. For as much as the show is taking a more nuanced and progressive take about aging and dating than frankly what a lot of society believes, they are not immune from the 2020s model of reality television casting where everyone does in fact look like a model. Even in this show, where they're literally casting dads in their 50s. Like, I understand that the moms have to be attractive. It's kind of like in the name of the show. But we don't get one normal looking person here. They all are just ripped. And just like, did these people even raise their sons? Or did they just be like, hey, Junior, sorry, I can't go to your football game. It's leg day. I have to work out and get the perfect body for MILF Manor season two. The standards for reality television casting, which MILF Manor Season 2 follows to a T, I don't want to say they're ruining reality television, but like, it, they're certainly ruining my dreams of ever being on Big Brother. Like, I'd like to pretend I could get casted on that show, even though I don't have a 12-pack. You know, my pitch for a reality television show? Normal people. Well, okay, I can see the flaws there, but we can use one thing to make the normal people a little more interesting. And that's a technique that MILF Manor uses a lot. Holy shit. The people on this show drink like sailors. They drink like sailors who are kind of ignorant to the fact that there are 70 cameras filming them at every moment, and maybe they should be a little bit more aware of that fact. In the first few episodes of the show, there are two explosive fights, which I would describe as being clearly influenced by alcohol. If you got a problem with you I being did. a past stripper, then that is I your problem. Don't. I don't give a if you go out there and sell your on the corner. I don't give a And of course, naturally during the fight, you have to have a confessional where one of the men admits that they find it hot. Historically, 
Seeing women fight like this is not unattractive. But yeah, this show, if you're looking for it, is completely awash in alcohol. It's basically in almost every single scene, they're gonna be drinking something, and it's probably not going to be water. Every single time a couple sits down to chat, they are either drinking wine or opening up a bottle of wine. And literally the very first thing that happens in Milf Manor when Jamie gets there is she pours herself a nice big old glass of wine. Oh, I definitely need a drink. Cheers, bring it on. Middle-aged white women are in fact never beating that stereotype. I do appreciate it in some ways because it is harkening back to an older era of reality television show when producers would just give their cast alcohol and see what happens and you did older man. Janelle's walking around the house like a diva and they're pretty much telling the truth about each other, but no drunk wants to hear the truth about themselves. Generally, people are more interesting when they're drunk because drunk people are messier and messier people makes for more interesting television. It's unfortunately true. But I'm also not ignorant to what the show is actually saying as a statement by putting so much alcohol in their episodes, basically saying, hey, society, you're right. You do need a drink to have a good time and people in our show are getting drunk on the regular. And that's probably not a great message to be sending because if you were playing a drinking game that had nothing to do with what the contestants were actually doing except for one thing, drink when the contestants are drinking, uh, I would be dead. The show is basically saying like, hey, alcohol is necessary for a good time, they're going to bars on dates, and you won't even really notice it on more than a subliminal level unless you're paying close attention. Except it does become a little easier to notice when a glass is thrown on the ground during a fight while both women are slurring their words, or when Jamie is confronted and voted off the island survivor style by none other than Kelly, Disco Mommy from Milf Manor Season 1. That's right, either to renew fan interest or to stir shit, but probably just both, Kelly is back on Milf Manor Season 2 looking for another chance at love after things did not work out with her first chance on Season 1. I will say that alcohol wasn't really the primary cause of that fight between Kelly and Jamie because Jamie came into the Milf Manor house with a boyfriend already, who she apparently missed while they were filming. I miss you, Mark. Can't wait to be with you. Her rationale was that she was accepted to be on the cast of Milk Manor when she had already just recently committed to her boyfriend and it became exclusive. So I can't even really imagine how that conversation went. You know, especially with a different show, like, hey honey, I know we just became boyfriend, girlfriend, but I really just got accepted to be on The Bachelorette, and I just want to see, I want to see what that gal is all about. I don't know why my man in that example had like a transatlantic accent. Like, they didn't have The Bachelorette in 1950, like, hey everybody, I'm The Bachelor, Richard Milhouse Nixon. But yeah, after Jamie tells one woman about how she has a boyfriend, that woman, tells another, then soon the whole house knows and they all confront her and basically are like, you have a boyfriend, leave. Honestly, it reminded me a lot of what just happened to Joe Biden, except instead of being told to leave the presidential race by Nancy Pelosi, Jamie was being kicked out of the Milk Manor house by Disco Mommy. Although, honestly, who can separate one girl boss from another? Milf Manor suggests, even by its very title, that this is going to be a show dominated by the women, and women in the show are going to have a lot of agency. Besides, obviously, the fact that by being on the show, the women are accepting and perhaps embracing the fact that they are being called mothers I'd like to fuck. So there is a level of objectification there with that term. I think that's inarguable, but I also do think there is some degree of empowerment there. So yet another contradiction, Milf Manor is full of them. But I think this is evident even in the gender ratio of the show. After the dads arrive, there are 10 men to six women. And a lot of the challenges are judged by women. The women are often the people who are getting the opportunity to ask the men on dates. I mean, for example, literally the stripping challenge, the men are stripping in front of the women for their enjoyment in a kind of group 
lap dance. And I imagine a lap dance can feel either very empowering or very awkward, depending on your perspective and whether or not you are currently in an Arby's. And on three different occasions, more men are actually put into the house. So the women are, you know, they're really not struggling for lack of options here. And if you want another example of the power the women hold throughout the entire show, look no further than my favorite competition for immunity in a reality TV show ever, the sexting challenge. What is that? Really, what is that? I know texting, but sexing? What's sexing? All right, you guys ready to get to today's immunity challenge? Yes. Ready. All of the women are told to make their own sex and then pick a man or men to send them to. And they're told to do this in the RILFI room, which is an acronym for the room I'd like to fuck in. Makes sense. It is a master bedroom that's kind of just open to anybody except you basically to use it kind of have to be okay with the fact that literally every single other person in the house is gonna know that you're in there and who you're in there with. A little bit awkward, a little bit voyeuristic. Hmm? Can we talk about voyeurism? No, this video is long enough. But after the women have created their own sexual text, they have to determine who they're going to send it to. And they can send it to multiple people, but because these are, you know, women who have families and are over the age of 45, most of them are only going to pick one person. This is a very intimate and vulnerable thing to be asking women to do, least of all on reality television, on a reality competition dating show. And they're going to pick the guy that they have the closest connection with. So at this point, it's kind of like a rose ceremony, except, except the rose. It's like a picture of these women naked. Mamma mia. They have all the men in this very like dehumanizing like circle. They're all just on the porch waiting and they're like, they're like, hey, I hope I get one. I hope I get one from all the women. I'm gonna laugh, bro, when someone, when all of our phones go off. Bing, bing, bing. And I've already broken down the ratio, so you know there are more men than women, so four men do not get any texts at all. And I don't know what's more uncomfortable and more funny, like the entire segment, like it's cr crazy that I had to watch that, or like the moments when the four men realize they are not getting any texts. I didn't get one, and I'm definitely one not giving up on love. I'm gonna reciprocate that. I'm, I feel like I'm in the same position, but I'm gonna put up a good fight. Like what what do you mean you're not giving up? What do you mean what do you mean you're still optimistic for a connection? What are you like the last Japanese soldier who's been fighting World War II for 30 years on an abandoned jungle island? Und im Osten ist der Feind bis zur Linie Lichtenberg Marlsdorf Karlshorst gelangt. Mit dem Angriff Steiners wird das alles in Ordnung kommen. Mein Führer Steiner, Steiner konnte nicht genügend Kräfte für einen Angriff massieren. Der Angriff Steiner ist nicht erfolgt. And it's at this point the show actually reveals to the contestants that if you did not get a text, you are removed from the manor. Which is why I love it because it was a secret elimination challenge and it was a secret competition for immunity. Oh my god, it was so funny in the moment. I was like yelling and cheering, man, that was crazy. And that was the last moment of episode 6. But before I wrap this video up, I want to talk about something, you know, a little bit more tender. So I did promise that the show had some genuine emotional moments, and they mostly come between the fathers and the sons because they obviously have known each other their entire lives, uh, mostly, and <laughs> they have the best interactions. Two moments in particular come from Ashley, a weird name for a man, and Stacy, an even weirder name for a man. And Stacy is a part of an absolutely wild and insane casting decision because Stacy and his son Miles have not spoken to each other at all in over five years. Stacy has ghosted his son <laughs> over the fact that Miles was very upset about the infidelity that Stacy did to his mother, his wife, when they were growing up. I mean, getting ghosted by your dad? I mean, that's just like, I really hope that he realizes that that is insane. And whenever God or gods or anything we have up there said, you know what, you two are going to reconnect and you are going to reconnect on MILF Manor season two. I haven't had a face-to-face -face conversation with my dad since I was 19. I haven't always felt that I could express my feelings to him because he's very overbearing, but he needs to 
take some responsibility. And maybe this moment and other moments are scripted or played up for the camera, but honestly, like in the moment where they are finally like realizing and rectifying and coming to peace with their relationship and realizing that neither of them really wants it and they want to be better going forward, they're both crying and it's like so heartfelt in my opinion. I feel like there has been no communication over the past several years. And I apologize for that. I wish I could have made better choices when I was younger, but I didn't. I didn't know no better. And I know I don't tell you all the time, but again, I, I love you. I wish nothing but the best for you, for real, for real. Thank you. I love you too. Love you, man. I really do hope if nothing else comes from the show that they can mend their relationship and actually be in each other's lives going forward. That's also probably the only thing Miles is going to take from this show because Miles was one of the people eliminated because he did not get a sexual text because he basically made no connection with any of the women at all. And another moment I found to be very touching was when Ashley and Jacob, who both get eliminated, share an emotional moment about the fact that Ashley realizes that eight months after his divorce, he's not ready to find love again, which, again, a rather human reaction. I'm just not ready to form any bonds with anyone. Sorry, Jacob. Is it good? It's tough. You know, we're disappointed, you know. Um... Excuse me? <clears throat> you right? Mm, not really. Not on the moment. <laughs> Especially because he talks about how he literally had a heart attack caused by the stress of his divorce, and the only person there for him was Jacob, and like they're just crying, and it's like, uh, you know, I, I, maybe I'm a softie, or maybe I've been following the show's own ethos about drinking a little too heavily while watching, but like that got me, man. Like, I was genuinely shocked both by how out of left field these moments felt, but also, like, by how genuinely sincere and heartwarming these moments actually did feel. It takes a lot to even be willing to be cast on MILF Manor, and I imagine it takes a lot more to be willing to let yourself be emotionally vulnerable on MILF Manor. So where does that leave us? Honestly, for a show called MILF Manor, I expected it to be pure early 2000s trashy, crazy, messy. And to be honest, yes, it is all of those things, but it's also more. It takes risks, it's trying to entertain you, but it also has some important things to say in society and does have some heartwarming moments. I think it has a lot more heart than half the reality dating shows that are out there right now. Although the bar for that uh, is in hell. But that's gonna do it for me, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Believe it or not, I still have so much more I can say about Milk Manor Season 2. If I wanted to put all of my thoughts in this video, it would have been much, much longer. So let me know if you enjoyed this video, like, comment, because I would love to cover the second half of the season up to the finale and see how the story of Milk Manor Season 2 ends. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment. What were your thoughts? Were you surprised that there is some meaning in Milk Manor Season 2? Is it still so trashy? Comment. Who's your favorite MILF in this show or in any show or in real life? Shout out Linda from down the way. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe. Helps me make more videos for you guys, new videos every week. And as always, my name is Patrick, but my friends call me Pat, and I'll see you for the next one.